Okay, hi everybody. We're on section 1.3 in Al Grosha's book, Developmental Math 2. We're going to talk about uh, some concepts of real numbers today. So, the first question is, what are real numbers? Real numbers are the numbers that you are very familiar with. They're the numbers we use for counting, for graphing. Um, the other types of numbers, which we're not going to study in this course, are imaginary numbers. Uh, so today we're just talking about real numbers. So we have um, this symbol right here, which are called braces. They're used to enclose any set of numbers. Here we have the set of natural numbers, and you can see them enclosed in the braces there. If we want to zoom it in a little bit, yeah. Okay, the natural numbers are the numbers that start with one and they go on infinitely in the positive direction. The whole numbers, which you can see here, are the set of numbers that start with zero and go on infinitely in the positive direction. The only difference between the, whole, the set of natural numbers and the set of whole numbers is that the whole numbers have zero and the natural numbers don't. The integers are an even bigger set. Um, and as we go down the line, you're going to notice that the natural numbers were contained in the whole numbers. The whole numbers are contained in the integers. So the set of integers, and you can see them here, the set of integers um, go from 0 all the way in the positive direction infinitely, and they go also backwards in the negative direction. So the integers are infinite on the negative and the positive side. But you can see that the whole numbers are also contained in the integers. The rational numbers are any numbers that can be written as fraction with an integer numerator and a non-zero denominator. And here's some examples of rational numbers. Even though they don't all look like fractions, they could all be converted to fractions. So that's the set of rational numbers. And of course, you can see that the integers are contained inside the rational numbers. The irrational numbers are the only numbers that really don't apply to all these other sets above them. The irrational numbers are the set of numbers with non-terminating, non-repeating decimals. So here we have one, and of course the ellipses here indicate that this, uh, this decimal goes on forever and ever and ever. Here we have pi, um, which I'm sure that you've used a little bit before, but we sometimes round pi to 3.14, but it is rounded because the decimals do go on infinitely. Uh, we also have the square root of 2 here. If you plug that into the calculator, you could see a decimal approximation, but the decimals do go on forever, infinitely, on the irrational numbers. So here's a nice little chart that outlines the real numbers and how they break down into different sets. I, I like this chart. Um, the real numbers is the name for the big set of numbers that you can graph on a number line. They are broken into two sets, and they're mutually exclusive. Real numbers are either rational, and they fall over here, or they're irrational, and they fall over here. The difference being the rational numbers can be written as fractions. The irrational numbers have non-terminating, non-repeating decimals. Um, if a number is irrational, it can't fall into any of these sets over here. If a number is rational, of course, it is not irrational. So these two sets, rational and irrational, are mutually exclusive. The rational numbers break down to a smaller set called the integers. The integers break down to a smaller set called the whole numbers. And inside the whole numbers is the smallest set called the natural numbers. So that's kind of how they break down. On the next page, we're going to classify the numbers. Okay? So we're going to start with asking ourselves, is the number 7 a real number? And of course it is. So we're going to start at the top. This is a real number. Is it rational or is it irrational? And the question there is, can it be written as a fraction? Of course it can. It could be written as 7 over 1. So this is a rational number. So we're going to classify that as rational. Underneath rational is integer. Is the number 7 an integer? And if we look back on the previous page, the integers go negative uh, 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. And would 7 be on that list? Yes, it is. So 7 is an integer. Um, the next set of numbers underneath integers, whole numbers. The whole numbers start at zero and go on infinitely in only the positive direction. So does the number seven fall into the uh, classification of a whole number? Yes, it does. So we're going to write whole number here. 
Does the number seven fall into the smallest classification of a natural number, uh, which start at one and go on infinitely? Yes, it does. So we're going to write natural here. Now I'm going to use abbreviations for the rest of these because this is a lot of writing. Uh, we can talk about them. Okay. So is the number five, uh, negative five, I'm sorry, a real number? Yes, it is. Is it a real number? So the abbreviation for real number usually has two big sticks and then they are. Is it a rational number? Can it be written as a fraction? Yes, it is. So we're going to call that the rats, rational. Is it an integer? The negatives and the positives, the tick marks on your number line are the integers, and yes, it is. We'll call that an I for integer. Is it a whole number? Um, if we flip back, the whole numbers are the numbers that start at zero and go on infinitely in only the positive direction. So the negative five is not a positive number, so it's not a whole number. So actually, we don't need this comma because it's not a whole number. Um, that would be it. It's a real number, it's a rational number, it's an integer. So let's talk about five-thirds. Five-thirds is a real number, so we'll use the R for real. It's a rational number, obviously it can be written as a fraction because it is. It's a rational number. Is it an integer? The integers are the negative numbers and the positive numbers that we would use for tick marks. You can actually see some examples of integers right down here on this number line. Um, five-thirds is not an integer. So we're not going to classify it as an integer. Um, of course, if it's not an integer, it can't be a whole number if it's not an integer, can it? And therefore, it can't be an uh, a natural number. Okay, so let's talk about the number pi. Uh, this is negative pi, actually. It is a real number. It does have a place on the number line. Is it a rational number? Can it be written as a fraction or... Is it an irrational number, a non-terminating, non-repeating decimal? And this is actually the only one on the list here that is an irrational number, so we're going to call it irrational. And there are no smaller sets under the irrational, so once you've classified a number as irrational, you're done. There's, there's no other smaller sets down here, so we don't have to worry about anything else there. All right, so let's look at this number line here. We've got what's called the origin here. It's a tick mark right at zero. The positive numbers go on infinitely in the right direction. The negative numbers go on infinitely in the left direction. And these are integers. Integers are usually what we uh, label the tick marks on our number line as. So let's see. We're going to graph the following on the number line. How do we do that? We're just going to make a, a point or a dot at each of these. So the first one we're going to do is negative 2. So to graph negative 2, we just put a point there. The second one is 0. So to graph 0, I'm just going to indicate it with a point. I'm sorry, but my stylus doesn't work really as well as a pencil, so they're not really colored in like they should be. Um, the next one is 5 halves. 5 halves is kind of difficult to tell where it will be on a number line until we change it to a mixed number. And to do that, remember, we divide. 5 divided by 2 is 2 with 1 left over. So this is really 2 and a half. So 5 halves would be 2 and a half, or right there between 2 and 3. And usually, when we put something between the tick marks, we label it with its value. So 5 halves is there. Uh, negative 3 and 1 fourth will be past negative 3, so it's between negative 3 and negative 4. It's not over this side. Positive 3 and 1 fourth would be more than 3, but since it's negative, it's less. It's between negative 3 and negative 4. So negative 3 and 1 fourth is going to be about 1 fourth of the way between negative 3 and negative 4. So let's label that as negative 3 and 1 fourth. And the last one is negative 1.5 or negative 1 and a half. So that's halfway between negative 1 and negative 2, which will be right here. And we'll label that as negative 1.5. All right. We've got inequality symbols here. This is the less than symbol right here. It's the little alligator. If you grew up here in Florida, we call these the alligators. This is the greater than symbol. So when you read them, you read this one as less than, and this one is greater than. 
we're going to fill in the blanks here with greater than, less than. All right, so which is greater, negative 4 or positive 4? Well, if you've ever owned a bank account, of course, we would rather have positive $4 than negative 4. So the greater than symbol goes here, but we this is actually the less than symbol because we read these left to right this way. So we're going to read this as negative 4 is less than positive 4. Uh, the next one says neg compares negative 2 and negative 3. So which one is greater, negative 2 or negative 3? You might be tempted to say negative 3 is greater, but if you look on your number line, we can sc scroll back up here. Negative 3 is here, while negative 2 is here. And because negative 2 is further to the right, it's greater. Okay, so negative 2 is greater than negative 3. So we need this symbol. And we read this as negative 2 is greater than negative 3. All right, when we compare negative 5 and negative 4, negative 4 is further to the right, so negative 4 is greater. When we compare 1 0.09 with 1.1. It's a little difficult to compare them uh, because this one has two decimals, but this one only has one decimal place. So if we tack on an extra decimal place here, which would of course just be the zero because it has no values, it's a lot easier to compare decimals when they have the same place. So 1.09 compared to 1.10, it actually looks like dollars. It looks like $1.09 compared to $1.10. And of course, $1.10 would be greater. Uh, so let's compare now negative 5 halves with negative 3 halves. Um, this is not as difficult as it may seem because fractions are sometimes difficult to deal with. If their denominators are equal, and in these fractions they are, they're both a 2, you can cover up the denominators and just compare the numerators. You're comparing negative 5 with negative 3 here. Which one is greater? Well, negative 3 is further to the right. So negative 3 halves is greater than negative 5 halves. So let's look at this. Um, some definitions here. The opposite of two numbers are numbers that are the same distance from 0. For example, 4 and negative 4 are opposites. 3 and negative 3 are opposites. They're the same distance from 0, but on different sides. Um, absolute value is this symbol. It looks like two vertical bars. This is really asking you the distance of a number from 0. So in the examples here, we have the absolute value of 5. How far is 5 from 0? It's 5 units away. So the absolute value of 5 is 5. The absolute value of negative 3 is 3 because it's 3 units away from 0. Um, this one's a little more difficult because we have some negatives involved. This negative is not inside the absolute values, but this one is. So we have to deal with them separately. First of all, the absolute value of negative 7 is 7 because it's 7 units away from 0. So that's why we have a 7 over here. But this negative is popping on afterwards. So uh, if you're used to dealing with positive and negative numbers, don't be fooled. These numbers, these negative signs, are not going to cancel across the absolute value bars like they do across parentheses because they're two different operations here. We've got absolute value asking us a distance and then this negative popping on afterwards, so they're not going to cancel across absolute value bars. Uh, let's fill in here. we got more greater than, less than. So what do we got? The absolute value of negative 4 compared to the absolute value of positive 4. So we might need to simplify a little bit. What is the absolute value of negative 4? How far is that number from 0? It's 4 units away. So this is actually equal to 4 which, of course, is the same thing we have over here. So it looks like we need an equal sign because they're equal. Um, here we have exactly what I was talking about up here with these negative signs not canceling across absolute values, but these are not absolute values. These are parentheses. And the negative signs do cancel here. The opposite, we read this as the opposite of negative 5. The opposite of negative 5 is the same value, but on the opposite side of the number line. So the opposite of negative 5 is positive 5. When we compare that to negative 3, of course, positive 5 is greater than negative 3. Um, here we have the absolute value bars. You can see them here around the negative 10. So we're going to simplify 
And when we simplify, the absolute value of negative 10 is 10, but this negative sign is still here. So they don't cancel across the absolute value bars. So we're comparing negative 10 with positive 10. And of course, positive 10 is greater. I think we have some more up on the next top of the... Yes, we do. All right, so this is still greater than, less than, or equal. We're comparing negative 9... And um, there is actually no other negative sign here to cancel with this. So this is just simplifying to negative 9 compared to positive 8. And positive 8 is greater. And then we have some fractions. We have the absolute value of 1 half. Well, how far is this from 0? Absolute value means how far from 0. So this is actually simplified to positive 1 half because it's an absolute value. This is not an absolute value. These are parentheses here. So these negative signs cancel across parentheses. This is the opposite of negative one-third is positive one-third. So now the question is which one is greater, one-half or one-third? If you think about a pizza, if I were to divide it in one-half, you'd be getting one out of two pieces. If I were to divide it into thirds, you'd be getting one out of three pieces. So if I took one piece, which one would be, be bigger, the one-half piece or the one-third piece? So I hope you realize that one-half of the pizza is more than one-third. All right, what do we have down here? Sets. Union and intersection of sets. So this is some definitions first off. Um, the elements of a set, this is a little bit of vocabulary, are the numbers, letters, or objects in a set. So these are just the things that are in a set. And again, we use the braces here, just like we did with numbers. Um, this example, if set A equals 1, 2, 3, 4, the elements of set A are 1, 2, 3, 4. This is just an arbitrary set. Don't, don't set any, any importance to this set. It's just something the author of the book made up for example purposes. It's not something that you, know, you need to wonder where did all these pieces come from and why is it there. It's just because that's the author made it up that way. The union of sets is used by this symbol. It looks like a U. Okay. Um, it stands for union. It's the combining of all the elements of two or more sets. So a union is when you put things together. That's what union means, just like a union in marriage or anything else would be putting two things together. So again, we have set A has the elements 1, 2, 3, 4, and set B has the elements 2, 4, 6. So it's a different set. The union of sets A and B, we would write like this with the U there, and that means that the elements 1, 2, 3, 4 from set A are going to be put together with the elements 2, 4, 6, where there is some overlap because the numbers 2 and 4 are in both sets, but you can see they're only listed once. So when I look at this as the union of A and B, all the sets of A are in there and all, this, all the elements of B are in there. The elements of both sets are in there. That's what a union is. The intersection symbol is the upside down U. That's how I remember it. Union looks like a, a U. Intersection is the upside down U. This is just listing the common elements or what the two elements have in common, the two sets might have in common. So if A is 1, 2, 3, 4, and B is 2, 4, 6, the intersection is going to be a list. And we write intersection like this of what they have in common. And this is the overlap I was talking about up here. Set A and set B have these in common. And the numbers 2 and 4 are elements of both sets. And that's what an intersection is. An empty set is a set that has no elements in it. So we're going to do some examples here. Let's see. What color do I like? Blue, I think, this time. Uh, we're going to find... We've got some sets here. So we've got a new set A and a new set B. So these are not the same as the sets above. The set A this time is 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. Set B is 4, 8, and 16. This says find A, and this is the union symbol, B. So we're going to make a new set. So I start with the braces. Ooh, that looks pretty bad, but that you guys get the idea. Union means that it's going. this new set is going to have all the elements. So I like to write them in numerical order. So I'm going to start with 2, and then 4, 6, 8, 10. And it looks like I'm just writing set A, but there's also another element that's in B that I need to include. So that would be 16. 
So and then I'm going to check to make sure all, el all the elements of A, 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10, are all there. And all the elements of B, 4, 8, and 16, are all there. So that's a union. Right, let's do an intersection now. This says find the intersection, A, intersection B. So this is what would be common between these two sets. So I'm going to look what... This is a smaller set here, so I'm going to look and see what this has in common with this. And it looks like the number 4 is in common. They both have the number 4. They both have the number 8. But the 16 is not common because there's no 16 over here in set A. So the intersection will be just the two elements, 4 and 8, that they have in common. Let's do another one down here. We have set C this time, 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and I think this should have been 11, it seems like. So let's, let's edit it, make it 11. And then we have set D, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we're going to find C union D. So starting with some braces, um, I'm going to start with the lowest element would be 1, the element 2, the element 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, not 8, because there is no 8 in either one of these, 9 and 11. So again, checking to make sure all the elements of C are 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, and 11, because we edited that, remember, to make it 11 there. And all the elements of D, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So we got everything. Okay, now we're going to do an intersection. Find intersection C, intersection D. So this is what do they have in common. Well, it looks like they share, they both have a 1. Uh, they both have a 3. What else? They both have a 5. And I think that's it. They don't share the 6, the 9, or the 11. Okay, so that would be the intersection of C and D. So I'm going to do one more. We've got two sets here. We've got set E is now 1, 2, 3, and set F, F is 4, 5, 6. So E union F is going to include all the elements from E and also all the elements from F. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. That's a union. The intersection is going to be the elements that they share. Uh, when I look at F, it doesn't appear that any of those elements are in E and none of the elements from E are in F. So they really have no intersection. This is what we call the empty set. And it's just two empty braces just like that.